Man, did we have a great time downtown Friday night. It was, it was, it was curb to curb population. I mean, as far as the eye could see, the eye could see probably up there close to City Center Park. It was people everywhere. And God positioned us in a wonderfully strategic place. And we had the opportunity to talk to folks about God and about their souls. Thank you, praise team, for bringing it together. And all those of you that helped and all those of you that came, give yourselves a hand. It was a great time. And there's more of that going to happen. First Friday of January, we're going to be back downtown at the fountains at the Center Park. And the youth rally for Section 5 will happen there. And we will join in with them and have a great evangelistic time together. If my wife would come, I want her to say something. She's got a fire always burning. What a blessed event we had Friday night. The Lord, it's just always great to be out. And, I, you know, you never get out there. Those of us that go a lot, you're always faced with the unexpected. So we get out there at 530 ready to sing and all prepared. And just our little spot um, blew the electricity. <clears throat> Strange, right? When you're, when you're on the war path and you're taking down strongholds, strange little things happen. We happened to blow the Christmas lights. They just gave us a little Christmas light to plug all our equipment into. So it was kind of humorous at that. But you know what? We stood around for an hour and a half waiting. The city was you know, desperately trying to get us electricity somehow, some way. And they couldn't. At the end, um, we asked my husband and Paul, would you go, go get the generator that we have? And that saved the day. We were able to start at 7 o'clock. <laughs> and at least we had two hours to sing. And it was the best hours um, when everybody was there. So, Satan, loser, you lost again. Lost again, loser. Um, we're coming into, and you know, my husband was talking about giving. If you notice in the Word of God, the Lord was more interested not in what they gave, but in what they kept. What they had left at the end of the day. Some people gave great amounts. He wasn't that impressed because he knew what they had. He looked at the ones that had nothing when they laid their thing, and he knew they're dependent on the Lord by faith. So, you know, sometimes we don't, we're so churchified of religiosity and all that, you know, just the things. We think we're holy just because we do these things. And God's always staring at the heart. And that's the kind of things we got to remember. How much have you held back? That's what I'm looking at. The woman that gave everything, she impressed him the most with one penny. Are you kidding me? Because she gave all she had. So remember when you offer the Lord stuff, offer him something important. Offer him something that's meaningful that you know, hmm, I'm going to feel the clinch of this. Because that's the kind of sacrifices he responds to. In the Old Testament, he wanted a lamb. He didn't want just a lamb. He had to give them the best lamb, the prettiest lamb. Yeah, the one that was the cutest, you know, whatever. He wanted the best lamb you had. So, you know, we, we are very satisfied with ourselves most of the time. <laughs> um, so we live in self-satisfaction. We know we do right in the sight of God and all these kind of things. But concentrate on your heart when you do things, when you give him things. Offer things that you're going to feel a little pinch right there. You're going to know you sacrifice, like fasting, <laughs> right? Whenever you fast, you know you fast, dead you know you're fasting, within minutes, you may never eat breakfast, but within minutes of saying you're fasting, you are dying for, you know, Chick-fil-A biscuit. <laughs> Randomly, too. Rando is the word. Randomly, you're starving to death. And so we know that the best saints of God are influenced by evil. 
because the Lord, went, I mean, the enemy wants to take your sacrifice away because he knows you gain power and authority over him when you do, when you lay things down. Um, when, you, when you pray, when you say you will pray, and then you pray, he, why does he hate it so much? Why does he hate the prayer wall so much? You think that, you know, no, it wouldn't bother him. You know church people are going to pray, but you, could, you should hear the excuses of why people can't do it or won't do it. And it's just, it's because he doesn't want you to be regimented. He doesn't want your life to not only benefit you, but to benefit the masses, right? Because we, we, a good portion of us pray every day. But he doesn't want other people to know this is how you gain power. So just, you know, putting time in on a prayer wall when a new convert can see it. And then you say, they, it's not for you. It's for other people to know. How do you gain power? Oh, they pray a lot. We have a, re, a prayer reading um, to reading of the Bible as we're going through it. Just write a little testimony, you know. Um, I was reading this scripture today, and it was really good. What are you doing? You're just being an influencer to someone else. So, you know, most of us don't have time to knock on doors and meet new people to lay hands on every day. Social media is a real easy way to influence another to good works. So I want to, um, again, remind you that all the reasons that the devil tells you don't do these things. It boils down to one thing. He doesn't want you to commit to prayer. And he doesn't want you to follow through with prayer. And he knows that if you're part of a successful team that's moving forward, that what happens? It's like the wave. It gains. It hits the shelf and you gain momentum. All of a sudden, there's a lot more power than just the regular wave coming in without the shelf, right? It just comes in lazy and slow. But when you come with a group and you, it hits, the devil doesn't want to hit that. He doesn't want you to gain a power and authority because you're among a group of people. A group of people now, got a tongue twister going, that hey, I'm part of a team. I'm going to do this. So I, I will tell you that I, I can promise you he has told me every reason under the sun not to be a part of the prayer wall, not to do it, okay? I've had to fight my way through every t single time. One thing I knew, it wasn't God telling me not to do it, right? So remember, this is the church you're raising your children in. This is the church you're raising your grandchildren in. They need to see that there's prayer warriors that carry this church right along. Don't listen to the devil. He doesn't want you to be a part of a prayer team. You're never going to find it convenient to pray. Um, he'll let you pray, but, but when you start trying to influence others, you become a threat and he will come at you with all he's got. And he'll make it sound perfectly believable. I can't even tell you. The most believable things are the things not you think of. The devil has told you, like, you're not powerful. And you go, I'm not powerful. Like, I need to become more powerful. That's the last thing you're going to say. Because you know it's him saying, I'm not powerful. When he says, you're not powerful. Say, I dominate your power in the name of Jesus, and I come against your kingdom in the name of Jesus. We'll see who has power now. <laughs> you got to have some clap back, right? Because he's going to come into your brain and tell you all these things you, you need to, you're guilty. Oh, your 10 minutes that you put today, that's not enough. People are going to be embarrassed for you. Guess what? Put it down. You're never going to include. We're coming to the, the top of the year. It's taken hard labor to get as many people as we could to be committed to a prayer team. And just as quick as we get them, we lose them. Why? The devil tells them a lie. Oh, I can't do that. I'm not on social media anymore. I'm not going to do this. What? It's so easy. The best churches all across the nation, some of them all meet at 6 o'clock in the morning in prayer. And it's powerful. The whole church is packed out. People, 
other churches, they meet at lunch. It's powerful prayer. It's packed out. We found this idea. We loved it. We said you can pray in the middle of the night. You can pray, you know, your shift, that you get off your break, but it will still be a powerful team. You know what? Let's get back on board. It's not for ourselves. We do the things we do to build the kingdom of God up. We're building the kingdom. How? By showing others this is what you do to get this. This is how it's done. You're going to feel the spirit. He's going to start talking to you more. You see how I can pr help pray someone through the Holy Ghost? Come here and follow me. Stay at my shoulder. I'm going to show you how it's done. There's a, st a statistic that says that if a Christian has not won a soul or done anything for the kingdom within a, the first year they will never do it in their life. Now, that's only a truth for whoever continues on the path. Once you're made aware of, yeah, no one really pushed me or showed me how, or I wasn't really taught what I should do to gain momentum and power in the spirit so I could lay hands on people, pray people through the Holy Ghost, we can make up for that now. It's never too late. And I know we're facing the, the brand new year. And most of you, I look at your face, I would say you want to get closer to the Lord than you are now. Let's start building his kingdom on the earth. So when we introduce people to the things we've got going at the church, they say, wow, this church is really supports each other. Wow, look at this team. Look how many people pray. Look how many people read the Bible every year. You know, it's rare. That thing is rare. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not easy to let it go because I know how hard it has been even for me to face myself with what I have to put down. Okay? Sometimes it's just embarrassing to write 30 minutes. But you know that's all you got. You know what? Rather than that, be thankful. I found 30 minutes today, and I'm going to find more tomorrow. Beat the devil down in the name of Jesus. And let's win this war. I want to be a church that's dynamic. I don't want to be a church that's slow moving, those lazy waves that don't even have a peak. No, we need, <laughs> Something needs to, we, we come against a shelf and phew, it needs to be 50 feet waves that go in the air. God bless you this morning. I hope you feel the presence of the God. We're going to build the kingdom on earth just like he told us to do. Some praise. Say prayer. Always equals power. Today in the course of our message... I'm going to hopefully show you just exactly why we pray, why we worship, why we engage in devotions of all kinds, and the profound effect it has on ourselves and on the world. Why don't we stand? We're going to dismiss our Sunday school at this time. And I will turn your attention to Romans chapter number 8. For those of you that know your Bibles well, you know that Romans 8 is the spirit chapter. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 9, and then verse 19. Reading from the NIV version on purpose. You, however, are not in the realm of of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. King James says they are none of His. Verse 19 says, for the earnest expectation of the creature this is in King James, waiteth for the manifestation. Everyone say manifestation. Of the sons of God. Taking the phrase from NIV, verse 9, Romans 8, 
I want to preach from the subject, the realm of the Spirit. Let's open our hearts. Precious God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the power of your presence. We believe that you're here and that you're going to show your strength in this house today. Release us, God, to absorb everything that's going to come from your word to touch our hearts. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Smile at somebody nearby. It won't kill them. Unless you didn't use your Listerine. Just hold your breath if that's going on. Waiting for the manifestation. Everyone say manifestation. I suppose that everyone under the sound of my voice this morning has no problem whatsoever understanding their accountability, responsibility, and duty to give account to our Creator. I don't, why are you here? Are you here for, for me? I'm not here for you, not in that sense. I want to be here for you, but we're really here for him. Because we owe our creator praise and worship that is due his mighty name. If you haven't worshipped yet like you know you should, there's still time to let go and let God have the glory in this service. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. So we have no problem recognizing the responsibility that we have to account to our Creator but many of us practically ignore any responsibility that we have toward the creation. Now, mind you, the scripture says all of creation is waiting. The sun, the stars, the planets, the systems, the galaxies, the universe, the microbes, the flowers, the animal, everything that comes under the category of created things is waiting on us. For those of you that th thought that life is, that you're waiting on life, life is waiting on you. And if there's a holdup, it's time to look in the mirror and you may discover that the reason why things have ground to a standstill is because we have hesitated in manifesting. Now, praise God. How, you, what, what does that mean? Well, you'll find out in just a minute. Everybody say manifesting. Oh, I know what you think when I say that word. You think, oh, good, he's going to talk about demonology and we're going to cast out devils and talk about the power of God we have over devils. And we do. But manifesting is not just a word that's relegated to the demonic realm. Manifesting is something that, is, uh, that falls and, uh, uh, under the operation of all spiritual realms. And you are in the realm, I hope, well, you're either in the realm of the flesh or you're in the realm of the spirit, judging by the response. I'll give you a little bit more time. Let me try this side over here. We got any realm of the spirit over here? How about any in the realm of the spirit? How about down the middle, realm of the spirit? Okay, praise God. All right, you're back. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm back. <laughs> Praise God. And so have you ever noticed how frequently the demons manifested themselves in the New Testament as opposed to the dormancy that you find in the Old Testament? How is it that demons are vigorous, violent, forward, 
when Jesus steps on planet earth and when the apostles preach, and he's practically invisible, not completely, but practically invisible, you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone casting out a devil in the Old Testament. So why is that? You ready? Because as long as God remained hidden, the devils remained hidden. But when God was manifest, I said when God manifested himself in flesh, devils manifested themselves in flesh. Oh, come on, somebody. You can judge the efficaciousness of your relationship with God by the kickback you get from hell. Go ahead and sleep it out. Go ahead and forget spiritual prerogatives. And you probably won't be harassed very much by the kingdoms of darkness. But if you'll ever wake up the mighty man inside of you and you'll manifest the power of the Spirit through your life, you're in for a battle, but you're not going to lose. You're going to win by the power of the whole. Hallelujah. Praise. Somebody needs to come against what's been coming against you. In the name of Jesus, we bind fear and doubt and prayerlessness and selfishness. And so, the visible world that we understand and see and participate in is actually made up of invisible packets of energy. Now, I'm not going to get wonky on you. But this is important because we meet people all the time, especially you university students, that say, I'm just a materialist. I don't have any place in my philosophy for God, heaven, hell, Bibles. I'm a materialist. I follow the science. I only, I only recognize what you can see and measure or taste and smell. The next time somebody tries to bait you with that line, you need to look at them and say, you're so 19th century. You want to follow the science? Now that we have tools sufficient to break material objects down to their smallest component parts. You know what we found out? The atom is not the end of matter. It's the beginning of a universe of, 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 of immaterial particles, vibrations, frequencies, information. Yeah, they're saying, well, somewhere at the base of it all are vibrating strings. Vibrating? You mean vibration is at the base of all matter? That means there is no such thing as a materialist. Everything is a vibration. The worlds were framed by the word, not the written word, by the spoken word. It still reverberates today. Oh, come on, somebody. Everything we see and know and measure, mountain, trees, skies, planets, solar systems, is all made of uh, things that uh, lack mass. Oh, so that means this. The material world that we look at and live in is an expression is energy made manifest. It's important that you get this. We're going to begin like Paul said. First the things which are natural. Then the things which are spiritual. So the question was asked to the physicist. Quote, is it true that all matter is simply condensed energy? Does that mean that the Big Bang was pure energy that later coalesced? into matter? The answer from the physicist, pretty much. Pretty much. Everything that you think is something is just as ethereal 
as the spirit realm. Physics.org. The article a caption read like this. Scientists discover how to turn light into matter after 80 years. 80 or so years ago, the famous equation E equals MC squared. We know, we all know, you can turn matter into energy. How do we do that? Over to the fire pit. Put a log in there. Light her up. You're taking something material and you're transforming it into energy. Heat, light, so forth. We know that can happen, but did you know according to the laws of physics, you can take light and do the opposite and turn it into matter? They just haven't been able to do it or to figure out how. Are you ready for me to explain just real briefly how they did it? How they did it? Well, they took the equivalent of you could calculate all of the energy required to power every factory, every house, every car, every business, every machine in the entire world. All the energy that it takes to run the world in one day. They shot it around a two and a half mile loop going this way. And then they took packages of, of light photons going this way. And they compressed this immense amount of energy into a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second into the size of about a period in a 12-point font. All the energy expended in a whole day around the world was used to send an atom, or was to send, was to send a, um, a photon one way and an electron the other way. Now watch this. A photon is light. It has no mass. It has no weight. It went this way. The, uh, the electron has mass. It went the other way. And then they met. And when they collided into each other, the describer said it was as if you would take a Mack truck traveling at near the speed of light, crashing into a ping pong ball. Well, what do you think would have happened? Well, it would have shot that ping pong ball back into the other ping pong ball back. And so when this collision happened, uh, it resulted in something that had mass. They turned a packet of light energy into mass. I know that. I didn't expect you to shout over that. But I want, I hope and pray you'll get to shout over this. In the beginning, and the world was without form and void. The Hebrew translation of without form and void. Tohu, bohu. Both of them come together oft times in the Old Testament and they mean chaos, formlessness, emptiness, wasteland, and the earth was without form and void, and God said, let there be light. How about it? If when God spoke light, it was a collision, bam, they talk about a big bang. Oh, yeah, but it was God that was doing the banging that day, and light hit, amen, other forces of energy, and creation is hurled into existence. Oh, yeah. Oh, somebody needs to encounter the light today. Somebody needs to be whacked with the Holy Ghost. How do you measure mass? Mass is an object is measured by one's something's resistance <laughs> to being moved by a force. Some of you guys got more mass than others. Some of you, all the preaching in the world can't move you. My wife gets up here week after week almost like an oracle sent from heaven to speak just words of pure spiritual inspiration. Then here I come. And there you go. God, what is it going to take? I'm tired of just a little stirring. I want an encounter with a divine light. I want the glory of God. I want the power of God. I need a breakthrough in my soul. I need an anointing. Hallelujah. All right, here we go. So let me say this point number one, starting with the natural. 
The physical world is manifested light. It's manifested. Now, let me just talk for a minute about Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. How many's ever heard someone try to talk about Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? You end up more confused after they got done than you were when they started. Well, let me say it like this. Maybe it will help. If it doesn't, you can see me after the service. When you think of Father, think of God in his, in his immense fathomless, searchless glory and power before there was a beginning. I mean, that's the Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God, before there was anything else. So the Father, think of it this way, as God before there was anything else. All right? So say it with me. God before Okay, so in the opening verse of John's prologue in John 1 and 1, we find it says this, in the beginning was the Word, was. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word became, verse 14, flesh. So John is occupied with this idea of what God was and what he became. You get it? So the Father is the unbegun one. The Son is the begotten one. So the Son is, the Father is God before everything. The Son is God among. What does it say? And you shall call his name Emmanuel, which is interpreted what? God with us. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody ought to be feeling some vibrational excitement, Holy Ghost power in Jesus' name. So the Son of God is God among us. It is God's glory manifested in a sinless body. That's important. Moses asked to see God's glory. All he saw was an afterglow. Because you cannot see, we cannot handle seeing God that was. But the church gets what Moses couldn't have. Because John 1, 1 and 14 says, And we beheld his glory. Moses said, show me your glory. God said, I won't because I can't. But there's coming a day when I'm going to manifest myself in a physical form and you'll be able to see, oh, the church ought not to have an off switch when you think about beholding his glory and truth. We beheld his glory full of grace and truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 7, 8, and 11 Now if the ministry that brought death, everyone say law, which was engraved in letters of stone came with glory, it did to some degree, Moses' face was irradiated with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory, transitory though it was. Will not the ministry of spirit, hmm, say grace, be even more glorious and if, and if what was transitory, transitory, say law, came with glory, how much greater is the glory that, come, that lasts or the one that comes by grace? Hallelujah. Ha. When should the Holy Ghost start wearing off? That's what I want to know. Ready for the answer? Never! Second Corinthians 3.15, but even to this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. What veil? The veil. The Israelites still have a veil because Moses asked to see his glory. He couldn't. They couldn't grasp the glory of Messiah. But we have seen his glory full of grace and truth. 
The reason why they couldn't see Jesus is because your glory doesn't come by judgment and truth. It comes by grace. Somebody say, no grace, no glory. You want to shut the light off in your own soul? Go around paying attention to everybody that you think has something wrong with them and criticize and put them down and then exalt your own self thinking, you're, we, I'm not better than anyone in here and nobody in here is better than me. And don't let us never forget that. But what I want to see when I see you is I want to see you through grace because if I can see grace on you, I can see glory. No glory, no, no grace, no glory. Oh, somebody praise him. Come on, praise him. So the Son is God within. A sinless body made manifest. Say that word manifest, it's important. Manifest in the flesh. In Genesis 1, God said. In, first, in John 1, God did. In Genesis 1, God separated. In John 1, God integrated. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him. To them gave he power. If you feel like you're an outsider, it's not God's fault. If you feel like it's a, you're an outsider, it's not the church's fault. Because to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You can become one of us today. Come on, can I take 10 more minutes to wrap the thing up and let it make some sense? Ever wonder what that earthquake was doing on Calvary that day? Was it just a geological function? Was it just an earthquake fault? Or could it have been something more? What if on Calvary that day grace smashed into glory? If God created the physical universe by light smashing into energy, what do you got to do to create a spiritual universe? Grace has to smash into glory. Jesus asked the Father, if it be possible... Let this cup pass. Obviously, it was impossible for there to be a spiritual kingdom. God before there was anything. God in the midst of creation in a sinless body. But now God's got one more step. He's got to get into sinful flesh. If it's possible, let me fill them with the Holy Ghost and not go to Calvary. Can't happen. Grace has got to hit glory so hard, my God, that an invisible kingdom springs into existence where God can live in sinful flesh. Oh, my God. Somebody needs to praise God. Somebody needs to praise God. You ought to thank God that he made a way. The Holy Ghost is God living in sinful flesh. All right, are you ready for this now? I'm, I'm going to try to bring it on home. However, you're not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm. You got dual citizenship, okay? 
You got a choice. You can live in the realm of flesh, touch, taste, see, smell, hear, or in the realm of the spirit. Cre I know what creation wants. I know what the rest of the universe wants us to do. Get before all. Oh, my. Would you quit wasting time shuffling your feet and twiddling your thumbs? Would somebody get a hold of God? We're waiting up here. We're waiting for a manifestation of the sons of. Come on. Come on. Have you ever noticed that the devil is never more violent and dangerous and virulous than when he manifests? He came charging at Jesus and the demoniac. He was manifesting. They beat up the seven sons of Siva and stripped them naked. They were manifesting. And here we are. Oh, placid, calm, hallelujah. Can I tell you, that's exactly where hell wants us. He wants us to sleep off our experience. He wants us to sleep through prayer. He wants us to sleep through worship. Not physically, but spiritually. He wants you just to clock out uh, as soon as you can. You want to know why? Because you're no threat to hell if you remain in the flesh. But if you enter into the realm of the Spirit and manifest the power of God, there's not a devil in hell that can't stop the church. Somebody let God have his way. Somebody let go and let God have his way. Somebody magnify him. Oh, hallelujah. Ah, I want us to stand. Psalm 42 and 7 in the NIV version says it like this. Deep calls to the deep. In the roar, everybody say the roar, roar. of your waterfalls, say waterfalls. All your waves, say waves. And breakers, say breakers. This is what the depth of the Spirit is calling. This is what we've made the mistake of doing. Putting the Holy Ghost to sleep and burying it deep within our being. This is what God wants to undo. He wants to send a storm to shake the waters, to agitate the surface, to get us moving. When the angel touched the waters and disturbed them, the miracles happen. And when the church becomes disturbed and the Holy Ghost is drawn from down deep and brought up to a surface experience and we're manifesting tongues, worship, shouting, dancing, praising, We'll never change the world if we let the Holy Ghost lay down inside of us. And so to, to paraphrase the words of the woman by the well. But Lord, the well is deep. And you have nothing to draw with. Let me say it back to you this way. But brothers and sisters, the well is deep. Do you have something to draw with? I have this. I have this. I have this. Why do we do all of that? To bring the glory to the surface so that the Holy Ghost would manifest, my God, in the name of Jesus. Somebody needs to manifest the Spirit. Somebody needs to manifest apostolic power. Somebody needs to manifest the anointing of the Holy Ghost right now. Right. Do I have some manifestors? Are you ready to step out? Do you feel the churning, the breakers, the waves, the roiling, the disturbance, the wind? Oh, yeah. 
Step out from where you are right now. Come up here. Let's get, some, let's get some hands in the air. Let's get some voices raised. Let's take on our trouble. Don't take on your trouble in a trance. Take on your trouble <laughs> in an epic outpouring of the glory. Come on. Take on your work problems right now in the spirit. Take on your health problem. Do you know when you're manifesting, it's easy to say to cancer, cancer, get out! Come on, tell your poor self-esteem, I'm not listening to you anymore. I'm not who you say I am. My God, there's power. If you need a healing, if you need a miracle, you better be up here. Oh, Rama Shandala Maha, Sata Laba Maha Laba Sata. If you need a miracle, hold your hand in the air till one of us comes to you and prays with you. Hold your hand in the air. We're coming your way.